Okay, let's get this started then. So welcome everyone to Bootcamp, and this is the beginner's guide to Android talk. Um, so I hope you guys are all in the right place. Uh, as Tim ably said in the in the introduction, this today is all about kind of getting you up to speed so you kind of know everything you need to know so you can get the most out of I/O. So this talk is is really pitched for someone who kind of knows what Android is but has never developed for it. Um, my name's, my name's Nick Butcher. I'm a developer advocate out of the London office, and I work on Android. Um, I love writing Android apps, and I hope by the end of this you will too. Um, and we've also thrown out some hashtags here so you can join the conversation and chat about what's going on. So this is the uh, speaker meter. So uh, as Tim said, this is a kind of experiment this year, and we really hope you, uh, you can use it. So I'll leave that up there for a minute. There's also a short code just there. So if you haven't got a QR phone camera uh, app, you can type that in. I'll also throw this link up at the end. If you want to uh, uh, wait to the end to leave your feedback, that's absolutely cool. So while people are snapping that picture, just want to get a quick idea of who's in the room. So can you put your hand up if you have written an Android app before? OK, cool. And put your hand up if you've kind of had an idea for an Android app but never had the know-how to actually write it and execute it. Excellent. So you guys, this is going to get the most out of this talk, I hope. Um, for some of the people who are more experienced, hopefully you'll pick up a few tips and tricks along the way. But I'd really recommend you go to the Android Best Practices uh, Lab later on today, um, which is going to really teach you some, some really good techniques. And also, we're going to be running an introduction to Honeycomb Lab later on. So if you fancy getting uh, up to speed with tablet development, then that's the place for you guys. OK. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Android is and what the Android platform is and how you develop for it. Um, I'll talk about writing your first app. So what is an app? I'll go through the anatomy of what it is that makes up an Android application. I'll talk about the ways you'd go about building it. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the unique ways that Android lets you uh, surface your content, access hardware sensors, and then how to make you know, not just a good app, but a great app. I then go into talking about the tools you can use to build these applications and finish up by going through uh, the process for publishing your application on the Android market. So Android, it's a, it's a bit of a juggernaut. It's in the kind of newspapers and tech press all the time. 170 plus devices, 100 countries, um, and shipping 350,000 devices a day. That's kind of like such a kind of staggering number to me, I feel. Uh, my colleague was stood here last year saying you know, proudly that 60,000 devices a day, and now we're at 350,000. So you can think of like the, the slant of the graph and the trajectory they're on. A little bit of mental arithmetic for you. That's over a million devices every three days. This really speaks to the opportunity out there and the reach you can have in writing an application and shipping it. The same thing, that, that kind of uh, size of opportunity can seem a bit daunting as well when you think of the variety and number of devices out there. Um, but the great thing about writing for a platform rather than for a device is that um, every device which has the Google services, so that's like Android Market and Gmail and Maps, for example, um, and everybody wants those, um, has to pass a compatibility test suite. This guarantees that um, any app written against our SDK will run on those devices. So it's our way of kind of uh, making it easy for you to write to the platform rather than have to worry about individual device characteristics. Um, so we build in tools to help support many different screen sizes and resolutions and form factors and hardware uh, variety. And the, and the system lets you take advantage of those where they're available. Android Market also helps you out by uh, filtering based on what the phone that the application is running on um, supports. Uh, so yeah, if you write to, work to the platform, you don't have to worry so much about the underlying phone. That said, the platform isn't a static thing. You are probably aware that um, the Android team is hard at work releasing um, new platform releases every kind of three to six months. So we've just had Honeycomb came out for tablets not so long ago, and the end of last year, Gingerbread for phones. Uh, we'd advocate always kind of targeting the latest and greatest so you can take advantage of all the new shiny APIs that get released. But we can teach you techniques to gracefully degrade your application. So if certain uh, functionality isn't available in an older platform, uh, you can gracefully degrade and perhaps use another technique. So for example, uh, multi-touch got uh, introduced at some point. Um, so you can detect at runtime in the application if the device you're running on supports that. And if so, enable a multi-touch kind of control. Else, you can fall back and perhaps offer buttons or something to 
offer the same functionality. So, writing your first app. So an Android application is really kind of a series of components. But it's all about kind of loosely coupled components within Android. Um, and the thing which holds them all together and makes them into an application is the Android manifest file. So I'm going to take you through what are these components that make it up. So the four major ones being the activity, service, content provider, and broadcast receiver. I'm going to take you through what intents are and why they're so key to the Android system. Uh, and then come back around to the manifest and how you string these things all together. So first up is the activity. This class is uh, how you write your user interface. So a single activity defines a single screen. Um, activities are kind of independent, and you string a series of these together to form a cohesive whole for a whole application. Um, it's possible to uh, invoke these uh, activities from within your application, but also from within other applications. So in that way, you can expose functionality from your app to other applications, and you can borrow functionality from other applications or from the system within your app. Um, Every class that you write uh, for an activity should extend the activity class, and you get a bunch of methods there to help you do your UI. The next major component I'll talk about is the service. So a service is uh, what does the heavy lifting or the, major, the majority of your processing in your application. So it's going to run all your kind of long-running tasks or, um, and so on. So a service doesn't offer any user interface, but it kind of is the kind of logic behind that. Um, other components can bind and interact with your service. So a great example of this is if you're going to write a music player application, for example. You might write the user interface as a, well, you will write the user interface as an activity, offering kind of, you know, skip, play, pause, controls, for example. Uh, but then you would use a service to actually control the music playback itself. So if a user starts playback in the activity and then leaves and goes and checks their email or browses the web, the service carries on running in the background and um, keeps on playing the music. The next component is the content provider. So a content provider it says it manages a shared set of application state. So really, it's kind of a facade on all of your persistence of, a, of any data. Um, it provides a consistent interface to the, to the Android system and to the rest of the world on how to interact with your data. So there'll be that querying, storing, updating. So um, it uses, uh, sorry, exposes CRUD type operations. It's also a RESTful interface. So Every unique entity has a, a URI associated with, associated with it, and then you can perform operations upon those URIs. So underneath this facade, you can back it with any kind of store. So commonly, it'll be a SQL-like database. But equally, you could uh, back your content on the, on the file system or on the web. It's up to you how you implement it. Um, you just expose this consistent interface so the system knows how to talk to it, and other apps know how to talk to it. So content providers allow you to expose data from within your application to other um, applications into the system. So for example, um, the system makes extensive use of content providers um, in the search infrastructure. So when I, on your Android phone, you hit search, and you can search through the data on the device. It's because of this consistent interface that it knows how to search an application you've just installed from market and how to query it. Equally, the system exposes its data to you um, as a content provider. So in your applications that you write, you can do things like query the contact system, or the call log, or um, the music on the device, or the pictures on the device, because of this uh, consistent interface. And the next major component is the broadcast receiver. So as I mentioned, um, Android applications are kind of loosely coupled uh, components talking to each other. Um, the way to listen to things, to, talk, uh, to messages between each component, is the broadcast receiver. So you can respond to system-wide messages. So um, if a text message comes in or a phone call comes in, a message will be broadcast to the system, and apps can respond and offer functionality based on that. There's two major types of uh, message that can be broadcast. Uh, first one being well, the normal broadcast, which is delivered kind of asynchronously to all receivers um, in no guaranteed order. Or there's an order broadcast, which you can say set a priority in which the messages will be sent out. So an example of this is if you want to write your own message for handling a, an SMS, for example, your own application for handling an SMS. Um, you might want your application to handle it rather than um, the system's built-in one. So you can register with a higher priority, catch the message that the, a new SMS has come in, and say it's handled so it doesn't carry on propagating. Broadcast receivers can be uh, registered to listen for certain messages, either um, statically, so you define it in the Android manifest, 
or at runtime, so you can dynamically start and stop listening as you wish. Broadcast receivers are just that. They're just listening in for messages. They shouldn't really be doing lots of heavy lifting and processing. So uh, once you've kind of listened, uh, listened out for a message, you want to hand off any long-running tasks to a service to process. So those are the, major, the four major components. Um, now, intents are the magic that kind of glues this all together, really, if you will. There's always an intent for, um, for launching on, and talking to um, different components in your application. So when we say a broadcast receiver listens for a message, that message itself is an intent. Um, now, these intents can be explicit or implicit. So an explicit intent is like an explicit message. It's kind of, it says who, exactly who I want to deliver something to. So if I have an application made up of two screens, screen A and screen B, and in screen A, I click a, bu a button which should take me to the second one. I can explicitly address it to launch screen B. So clicking that invokes screen B, and it launches. More interestingly is the, um, interesting is the implicit intent system. So just by describing um, something you would like to achieve, so an action you'd like to perform uh, upon some data with some extra metadata, um, and then handing over to the system and asking, is there anything installed on this device which can handle this action on this type of data? So by standardizing on a set of common actions, so you know, I want to view this data, I want to send this data, I want to edit this data, um, you can have lots of different and unforeseen applications handling um, a standard message. So a great example of this is photo sharing. If I had, it, write an application um, which kind of can take photos and then share them, you know, I could think about all the possible ways that you know, places I want to share that photo to. You know, I could write in Facebook sharing, Twitter sharing, Buzz sharing. But more interestingly, I could just say, I have this data of type kind of photo, and the action I want to perform on it is share, and hand over to the system and say, hey, what's installed that can handle this, um, this intent? And then you know, the user could have installed you know, an obscure or kind of different social network or whatever site that they want to share it to. Uh, and that application can then say, hey, I know how to handle a share action on a picture. Let me do it. So by doing this um, kind of standardization on um, actions, you kind of can have this unintended um, uses of your data. It's great. Uh, one of my favorite um, examples of this is an, an application called Barcode Scanner. So Barcode Scanner um, has said, hey, I've got this kind of great use case of scanning barcodes, and it's really helpful. But what wouldn't it be even greater if I can offer up this functionality to other applications? So what they did is they standardized on an action and published this action out um, on their website. Uh, and now other ap applications are free to invoke this application. So the way they do that, um, so for example, this is one of my favorite grocery apps in the UK called um, Ocado. Um, so Ocado wanted to offer um, the ability to add groceries to your basket via scanning a barcode. But they didn't have to write their own barcode scanning software, which is quite complex. They simply click on the barcode button, and this will invoke the barcode scanning application, which will do the work of scanning the barcode, and then hand back to the grocery app to add it to your basket. So this is a pretty complex task, I guess, scanning a, um, a barcode. Um, but it can be achieved very simply for the calling application. So the grocery app just has to include some very simple, you know, not a huge amount of code for quite a complex interaction um, in order to accomplish it. So going through this, this is um, one of those explicit intents I mentioned earlier. So when we create the intent, we know exactly the action we're trying to perform, so this um, android.scan action. And we set the package which we know will perform it. Uh, we can then send some extra metadata. So we're saying here that we want to do a QR code type scan. We then do a call to start activity for result, passing in that uh, information we just set up. So what this does is it's going to start a component written in an entirely separate application and run it. Now, to the user, this is completely transparent. So I just think I'm in my grocery app. I just hit a button, and a barcode scanner comes up. I've got no idea that the developer of the grocery app didn't have to write this barcode app. It's kind of seamlessly integrated. So the user does the work, takes a photo of a barcode, um, and finishes um, scanning. And the result gets returned back to the calling application. So here we can check some things, like make sure that it completed successfully by checking for the result OK. and then grab back from the intent uh, the result. So this is the actual code that they scan. So in very few lines of code, you've got this quite complex interaction. 
all powered by intents. So wrapping those back up together, it, we're coming back to the Android manifest. So the manifest declares all of the components within your app. So this is where you're talking to the system. So when the user installs your app, you're saying, hey, this is what my application is actually made up of. I have this many activities, this many services, this many um, content providers, for example. It's also an opportunity to declare the features that your um, application uh, requires. So uh, if you uh, need internet, for example, or if you require um, GPS hardware, then you can use the Android manifest to declare there and then what your application requires to run. So the system knows how to run you as well. You can also state uh, what versions of the Android system you require for your application to run. More interestingly, you can actually say uh, the lowest version you require to run, but you're also aware of a higher version. So you can set a target SDK of, say, the latest and greatest, say, gingerbread, but I also um, run and compatible all the way back to, say, Cupcake. So by doing this, you're essentially completing a contract saying, I won't use any of the newer APIs when I'm running on an older version. So when you're writing your app, it's really important to remember that you're running on a multitasking environment. Mobile phones and tablets are kind of multitasking devices with lots of things going on at once and often quite memory constrained. So uh, users will switch between your applications all the time. The system's going to run low of memory. Calls are going to come in. Um, so your application, when you're writing it, needs to be aware that you're in this kind of busy environment and be able to handle it properly. The system will call into your application with a at a series of kind of callback events to let you know when these events happen. So it's really key to remember that at some point, the system will kill your application. When we were writing our amazing apps, it's kind of really kind of nice to think that the user is going to sit there in full concentration and just use the app as you kind of intended, and then happy days, finished, and they're done. But in reality, there's going to be 101 things going on at the same time. So the key thing, I'm going to walk through this um, um, activity lifecycle in a bit more detail, but the key message is to respond and work with the system, the system lifecycle um, and make sure you save your state, for example, so that if the user comes back to your application, it has been killed by the system. They don't get surprised and say, hey, where's my data? I was in the middle of something. So when you launch your, uh, an activity for the first time uh, and the activity is created, uh, you'll get a call back into your um, applications on create. This is kind of similar if you've done some Java programming to kind of your main method. It's the first entry point, and it's your first chance to do any kind of setup and initialization logic. You then get a call back into the on resume method, which is just before you're about to become uh, foreground, uh, and then your activity will be running. So if while your activity is running, say a call comes in or they switch to another application, the system will then let you know that that's happening to your application and it's no longer going to become foreground. So we get a call back to um, your application's on pause. Now this is key, like in on pause, you definitely want to be saving all your state um, so that if a user comes back to your application at some point, um, it's still in the state that they uh, thought it was in. There's nothing worse than kind of, you know, I was playing a game or something like that and then the call comes in and then I forget I was playing the game and I, and I surf the web and I come back to the game and it's kind of, I've lost all my progress and you have to start again. I mean, that's an example of someone not using on pause properly to save their state. So if after the calls come in um, and the user just comes back to your app uh, straight away, you're going to get a call back to the on resume. So then you can just make sure that the um, application is in the right place. But if they don't come back to it, so they go off and surf the web or whatever, and the system um, starts running low on memory, it's going to kind of kill your application. It's going to reclaim some of that memory. It's going to stop you. So the user should be completely unaware that this is happening. So if, they can, if your activity gets destroyed, and then a user later comes back to launch your application, it should be like it was just sitting in the wings waiting. So when they go through the on create again and on resume, you need to be grabbing the state that you saved in on pause um, to set it up like it was just waiting for them. So next up, I want to talk about some of the unique ways that Android lets you surface your content to the user. Um, Android's got a really great notification system. So you can throw up notifications up into the, um, the top bar, as I've highlighted here. Um, and you can show like an icon. Uh, you can buzz the device or flash a light if it has one. And, and you can also have some scrolling text going across. Or if you pull the tray down, you can get some expanded um, information. So these unobtrusive um, notifications are, are fantastic, I find, for kind of these busy lives that we lead with 
500 apps installed and things. I don't want to be going into my app all the time to check it. I want the app to let me know whenever something happens. So it lets you kind of create event-driven um, kind of models so that the user can come back whenever something interesting has happened. You can also provide quite a lot of information through them. You can provide custom views in this um, expanded tray. So if you want your happy application, show a progress bar or something to let the user know something's going on. You can also deep link, link to a, a place within your application with uh, setting one of these intent objects, a pending intent, um, onto the notification. So it, it doesn't have to take them just to the front screen of your application. It can take you right in there. Widget, so another um, strong um, feature of Android. So many times I'm using my phone and kind of, you know, you're bored or on the bus and you're just kind of playing around on the home screen. Um, by letting you put your application's data right there on the user's home screen, it stays kind of form forefront in their mind. Um, you can have the data on the widget updated regularly, so it doesn't have to be just static information. You can update it when events happen um, or just on a time basis. You can also offer multiple uh, widgets for your um, application. So one application can have you know, a large widget, a small widget, a widget to show this uh, type of information, this type of information, and you can have interactivity. So um, this music player widget, for example, lets the user kind of play the music or skip the track right from the home screen. So it's a great way to drive user engagement. We find applications which have widgets included in them um, have high use rate. People kind of keep on coming back to them and don't uninstall them. And people love them. They're fun. And next up, I want to talk about cloud device messaging. So this lets you um, reach in from your servers kind of right down to the Android application and kind of send it timely messages. You can send like tickles, like it's got a very small payload, but it's very timely and very fast delivered. So you can use this to kind of push um, messages down to the device. So your application doesn't even have to be running when you want to send a message to it. Um, if it's not running, the system will wake up your app and deliver the, uh, the push message straight to your application. And then it's up to you how you respond. So there's no you know, predefined UI. You don't just get a, a modal dialog popping up or whatever saying something is updating. It's up to you. So if, for example, you're writing a messaging app or, say, a, a news app, you can have your servers reach, uh, ping the Google Cloud to Device Messaging Services, which will reach down to the device and wake up your app and let it know there's some new content. Your application then like, wakes up and can then retrieve that content straight down from the web server and let the user know, perhaps using notifications. Because it's built on top of the existing uh, Google Messaging Services, so the same thing that Gmail and uh, Google Talk uses, um, there's minimal effect on the battery. You're not keeping other kind of persistent channels of communication open between the device and the cloud, so you're not going to be hammering the user's battery. Okay, so we talked about some of the cool features in Android. I'm going to talk about um, how you can go about building them to create your app. So building your app's UI is kind of uh, very important. So the user interface is a hierarchy of uh, widgets which extend the view and view group classes. So you can define these in code and create them all in code, but it's um, much cleaner to uh, define your layouts by XML. So on the left here, we have an example of a layout. Uh, so this has got a linear layout, which includes a label and a button. So very sim simple, very clean to define your layout. Uh, and then the system will kind of inflate that layout into a series of these hierarchy of these objects. So Android, by default, comes with a palette of um, widgets which you can use, so like the linear layout, the text view, and the button. But you can also create your own components to, if you need some richer controls or combine existing ones into a kind of a custom component. So once you've defined your uh, layout, you can then uh, tell your application uh, how to use it. So in an activity below, uh, we're calling the method setContentView and passing it an uh, identifier. So it says here r.layout.main. So imagine the XML file above was called main.xml. Then the call below is telling the application, this is the layout file I want to use for my display. So where would that file live? So anything that's not code lives in a res folder in your Android project. So in here, we have a folder called layout, and there's that main.xml. So right here, you could define your, um, your application's layout. More interestingly, the resources folder lets you provide qualifiers to provide different versions of resources for different configurations of device. So uh, just beneath that layout folder on here, you see there's a layout dash port. What this means is it's allowing, we're specifying a completely uh, different layout for a device when it's running it in portrait mode, that means, rather than uh, a, the default one in layout mode. So at runtime, 
the device will know that what configuration uh, is running in and grab the right resource appropriately. This is really powerful when you think about all the different, um, so when you look at the different qualifiers that you can use. So as well as um, orientation, you can use the density of the um, screen that you're running on, um, the size of the screen. So if you're running on, say, a small device or an extra large device, um, you can have different layouts or different image assets. Um, or even if you have a, you're running on a different language of the device, um, then you can provide different strings, for example. So looking at, out there what devices are on the market, there's a huge variety in kind of sizes and shapes and capabilities. So you've got you know, your tiny little phones to regular phones to tablets, even to up to kind of Google TV. So you have to think about these devices and how your applications will run on them. So supporting multiple different screen sizes, uh, there's lots of techniques built into the Android platform that will help you out with that. So one technique I'd, I'd definitely advocate using is the relative layout. So don't kind of size things in exact like pixel dense um, dimensions. Using relative layouts, you can say, I want this uh, kind of to the left of this component, and this to the right of the component, and this taking up the rest of the room. Um, so you're not kind of so constrained by fixed dimensions. You can use um, attributes such as wrapping content and matching the parent um, and weights. Say, this wants to take up a third of the screen, and this to take up two thirds of the screen. And this will help you to keep your um, your layouts to scale appropriately, and uh, no matter what the device. Another great uh, platform feature is the DP, or the Density Independent Pixel. This lets you say, I want this to be 100 pixels when it's running on a, a medium density screen, for example. But if I'm running on a super high density screen, I want it to be sized slightly larger. So the physical size of it will be the same, even though the, the, the pixel size is larger. So techniques like this, kind of think web style development. So you have kind of fluid um, layouts that will scale no matter what the size window it's running in. You can provide, using the resource framework that I, I talked about in the last slide, you can provide specific density assets. Um, so on a high density screen, like say the Nexus S, you can uh, provide a higher resolution image so it looks great on that screen. Um, whereas on an older G1, you might want to provide a lower res image so it's not taking as much size. You can use um, the resource qualifiers to provide specific layouts for different devices. So if, I, if your application is running on a Motorola Zoom, for example, you can use a layout dash X large to provide an optimized layout for that larger device. Another great technique is a nine patch drawable, which is a, a system of specifying which parts of your image assets can be stretched and which should be rendered as, up, as is. So this lets you say, um, you know, create a a text box by saying the corners should be rendered exactly as they are, but the middle bits can be stretched out. Um, while I'm here, I'd say if you're interested in learning some great techniques about this, you should go along to the um, best practices, um, Android best practices code lab later on today, which is going to go into look much more detail about how to use these techniques. So one of the most interesting things about writing uh, Android applications at the moment is the uh, devices they run on have these fantastic hardware sensors. So you know you have access to cameras, to accelerometers, G meters, um, light meters. So all of these kind of like really fancy kind of sensors that haven't been available to us in software development on kind of desktop devices enable all kinds of um, interesting applications to be written. So using the um, Android system, you can use the sensor manager to find out what sensors are available to you to your application at runtime. You can then register listeners to listen out for updates to that. So this is, you can you know, get hold of a, a, a G meter and listen for changes in orientation, for example. So yeah, really think about what sensors are available in devices now and what's coming, uh, and how you can really use that to make a really kind of compelling application. Another Android strength is its ability to do background tasks. And when I talk about background tasks, I don't just mean kind of multitasking. I'm not talking about listening to music and reading your email. I more mean um, the system's ability to accomplish a task without any interaction from you. So um, you can use a, the alarm manager to schedule your application to wake up and perform an update without the user having to um, interact with it. So think about if you write a news application or something which um, grabs content from the web. There's nothing worse than like pulling out your phone, opening an application, and seeing like a, you know, a modal loading dialog or nothing's happening. Or if I pull up my phone and I have no um, out coverage, um, you know, and it doesn't let me even get access to any items. It's so frustrating, there's no, especially because there's no reason for it. 
using kind of background tasks and, and periodic updates, your application can wake up in the back and in the background grab content so it's right there, ready to go, fresh for the user to use when they want to. So this is great. So it's available offline and it's always kind of up to date. There's another uh, point. It's one of my favorite features of the system that you also use inexact alarms. What this means is you can, um, you know, you might be worried if you have 50 apps installed on your device, all doing this kind of waking up in the background and checking content, that your device is going to be awake most of the time. It's going to hammer your battery. But the system gives a system called inexact repeating alarms, which will actually phase shift your alarms to all coincide and go off at once, so that um, it has minim it minimizes the effect on your device. So be kind of friendly to the user. Next up, Android makes it really easy to make an accessible app. So using things like setting the content description, uh, description on your content um, works well with the kind of screen reader technologies. Um, it also, Android also fully supports uh, navigation via D-ball and trackpad. So um, as a developer, you have to be aware of how to implement this. So setting appropriate drawables that respond to the states when um, a controller is selected by the D-pad to kind of indicate that selection. I would uh, definitely recommend you go to the new kind of best practices on um, accessibility section and read up on how to make your app accessible, or better yet, try it. If you um, install the TalkBack application, you can try navigating your application in kind of um, accessible, accessible mode and see how it is for kind of visually impaired user. Next up, I'll say that there's over 150,000 applications in the Android market, 150,000. Um, so how do you stand out? I mean, the way to do that is to signal quality. Um, so using the techniques we talked about before, um, this is how you kind of like get users to realize your app is well made. Um, so work with the activity lifecycle. Make sure your app isn't kind of dumping um, the user's state when it kind of gets killed off by the system. Offload any long running tasks into the background so that um, using a service so that they, uh, the user interface stays buttery smooth. Users have a very low kind of um, tolerance for any latency in the user interface. So make sure that any kind of long-running task or processing isn't happening on the UI thread that you hand off um, to the background. What's more, listen to your users. Have a conversation with them. The Android market offers them feedback on your application, so you can leave comments on your application to let, let you know um, what they think of it. Sometimes they're quite colorful. Um, better than yet, you can offer your own feedback mechanisms. So if you set up your own kind of forums or you know, Stack Exchange or some, some kind of technique for having a feedback mechanism so your users can say what's working for you. you know, as, a, as the writer of the app, you know exactly what the functionality is and how to use it, but you might not realize that it's, uh, it's not obvious to some of your users. And to that end, work with a designer I'd always advocate. As developers, sometimes we're, we're very keen to run 100 miles an hour and get as much cool functionality into an application. But if your application isn't usable or aesthetically pleasing, your users might not find it uh, and, or keep coming back to it, so it might be wasted. Cool, so to put together these wonderful applications, here's the tools you can use. First up, you want to go and grab the Android SDK. So this SDK will have all the kind of um, tools you need for building your applications, as well as things like uh, the emulator, um, which will let you run your application without the device. and tools for signing your application when you come to upload it. There's a very polished tool chain built around the clips, um, which is going to make your development life really easy. So um, if you install Eclipse and then grab the Android Development Tools plugin, this is an Eclipse plugin, which will make it really easy to um, build your code um, against the SDK, to deploy it onto a device or onto the emulator, uh, and interactively debug it. We do support other um, tool chains as well, so IntelliJ or just um, using um, Ant, for example, to build is completely um, fine, and lots of people like that. Uh, but for new people, getting up and running, um, Eclipse is definitely going to be the kind of least path of least resistance to getting going. Once you have the ADT installed, you can use the SDK and AVT, AVD manager to kind of grab all the latest versions of the platform. So when we release a new version of the platform, so when Gingerbread came out, for example, we'll release an, an update to the SDK so you can build against these new APIs that have just been released. And so again, if you're getting started, um, these slides will be online. I'd advocate you go towards the, the full guide to getting going. It will walk you through the process of getting up and running. Cool. So you've built your amazing application, implemented your idea, and you now want to share it with the world. So here's how you publish your app on Android Market. 
it couldn't be simpler. You just develop your application, register, and then hit publish. So if you go to market.android.com slash publish, you can um, create a developer profile and sign in with a Gmail account. And then there's a one-time uh, $25 fee to, um, to gain access to, to the market. This is just to kind of prevent spam, um, spam applications. So when you sign up, you agree to the developer distribution agreement, which kind of um, sets out the agreement between you, yourself as a seller and Google. Uh, and then if you want to sell your applications, you can also create a checkout market account, which will enable you to, to sell their apps and get, the, get revenue for it. So once you've signed up, you just log in, and it's a self-service process to upload your application. There's no review process at all. You kind of hit upload, and your application is live to the world. Google does perform a kind of um, retrospective takedown of some applications. So if you're, for example, if someone infringes on the copyright uh, and that gets reported back to us, we will take down the app. Um, but there's no review process. So you know, as soon as you decide to listen to the user's feedback and like, kind of fix a bug they experience, you hit publish, and within minutes, it's live and updating for all your users. So the maximum application size you can set is uh, 50 megabyte, and that's entirely hosted by us. Um, and then the download will be accessible both on the device and on the recently launched Android web market. So the web market, if you've not used it, is a fantastic tool. Um, not only does it kind of expose all the, all the great applications you can see on your device, but it's also good for using traditional advertising techniques. So you can drive um, any existing web traffic you might have to this place on the web. Um, so they can then kind of discover your app and install it straight from the web website. To this end, we let you provide like kind of high-res promotional images um, and videos onto your listing so that users can see immediately how high quality your application is and get an idea of what using it will be like. In addition, as a publisher, you can log into your publisher account uh, and see any application crash reports. So if your application um, encounters a bug on a certain device, and the user hits um, report, you can see the complete stack trace right in the web browser. So you can um, immediately keep on top of any kind of crashes or stability issues you might have. We also launched lots of um, application statistics for your application. So you can see uh, what platforms uh, your users are running their application on, um, and also what languages they're in. So you can use this information to improve your app. Say if you find out that you have lots of users in a certain country, you might want to localize into that language. When uploading your app, you can also target quite specifically um, your audience. So in the publisher site, you can set um, countries or languages you want to target. So say my UK grocery app um, is only available to UK users, so they can restrict it to only be available um, to people using Android Market in the UK. Similarly, you can target based on hardware um, availability on the device. So if you write an application which requires GPS or telephony or a level of OpenGL, in your Android manifest, you specify through the user's feature tag that you require this attribute. Um, and then Android Market will know not to offer your application to devices which don't have that functionality. So that was a crash course in what an Android application is, how you go about writing it, some of the um, unique features that you have available to you on Android, and how to make an awesome app. Um, I hope that was useful to you, and I do advocate you to kind of go along to uh, some of the code labs today where you get a chance to actually get your hands dirty and try out writing applications for the first time. Um, do please fill out the uh, speaker meter and let us know what you think of the sessions. Um, right, so we have a bit of time at the end. If anybody has any questions about writing an Android app, you can go for it. Yeah, um, we're going to be uh, on the IO Bootcamp site uh, after the event. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you very much.